There have been some significant revelations this week in regards to the Canadian housing landscape that really speaks to how impossible it is going to be for the government to build an additional 2 million homes over the next seven years, as promised in their Budget 2024 released earlier this month. You essentially need absolutely perfect conditions in every industry and every segment that contribute to the housing market to barely keep up to maybe 70% of the actual demand there is out there, let alone to double, more than double that level of production. And the headwinds out of the gate of the government's initial, or sorry, the government's initiative, I mean, they're immense, okay? We're going to dive into all that this week and demonstrate how the claim that they've made for more affordable housing is basically a complete fallacy, just as it was in 2015. Because if you remember, Trudeau campaigned nine years ago on almost an identical platform, including all these housing promises. Some of them you could literally cut and paste from the last budget into this one, including, I'm going to read this verbatim, inventory all available federal lands and buildings to see what could be repurposed and make it available at low cost for affordable housing in communities where there is a pressing need. I mean, that almost exactly that exact same statement was in the new budget. Second, modernize the existing home buyers plan so that it helps more Canadians finance the purchase of a home. They're doing that exact same thing this time around as well. And lastly, review escalating home prices in high price markets like Vancouver and Toronto to keep home ownership within reach for Canadians living in these areas. Since those claims and since Trudeau took power, Canadian home prices are up about 62%. No affordability there whatsoever. Now, let's look into why the majority of the government's current housing promises regarding an increase in housing supply, they simply will not happen. Let's dive into first housing starts, okay? So on the heels of this announcement to build 3.9 million homes over the next seven years comes some data that simply demonstrates, again, how much of an impossibility it really is. The housing supply deficit in Canada hit a new record in Q1 of this year by a large margin. And yes, this is largely driven by huge population growth, but it is worth noting. So the measurement is a, a ratio of growth in the working age population compared to housing starts, right? New homes that are under construction. The deficit, the deficit dropped from an average of about 1.75 down to a whopping minus five. So for every one housing start, there are five people that were added to the population. Housing starts in our country peaked in 2021 at around 285,000 and have dropped to about 245,000 today in this cycle. But when we compare that to the single family home, the number gets almost comical, right? There's been one single family home start to every 20 new people in the country over the past two years in a row. This will not get any better (laughs) as the leading indicator, of course, is building permits, right? And building permits are dropping rapidly now as well, sitting at the lowest amount since 1983. There are less building permits for single family homes today than there was in 1983, but it gets worse. Looking at the high density land transaction volume, and what does that mean? That means developers buying up large parcels of land to build towers, to build homes. That metric has basically completely collapsed when we look at the greater Toronto area. The Toronto area has averaged around 200 or so of these high density land transactions, right? The sale of of land for high density buildings over the past uh, 10 years or so, over 200. Year to date of those same transactions in Toronto is 20. They're on pace for about 80 of these transactions in the GTA compared to 200, which is normal. So that's a 60% collapse. That simply means that, you know, all these developers are just not buying land right now. The ones that are holding it, as we've talked about extensively on this channel, a lot of them are going bankrupt or the buildings are going into receivership. And on the heels of that, do you think it's a great landscape for developers to be buying more land with the intent to build more? Uh Uh-uh. So this is yet another huge indicator that there's going to be a huge shortage of new towers being built over the next seven years, especially if this low rate of transactions continues. Wow, that sounds fun. Into mortgages, it actually doesn't get any better either. Looking back 30 years, when people renewed their five-year 
uh, fixed term mortgages, the difference in payment typically per $100,000 of mortgage averaged about minus $100 or so, meaning you're paying off more of your mortgage every time you renew, you owe a little bit less, and so on and so forth. This was true from about 1993 to 2019. But from 2022 to today, however, the average uh, fixed rate mortgage renewal is seeing a $111 increase in payments per $100,000 of mortgage meaning people are either taking on more debt because of the interest rates that they have to contend with, or there's simply not enough money going towards their payments to pay down what is owing. That said, most people obtaining a new mortgage do have some faith in lower rates in the near future and are opting to go with the three-year fixed rates to the tune of 40% of all new mortgages in the past quarter. This is interesting because the total share of insured mortgages has dropped from 56% back in 2014 down to 24% today. That's more than half. This means that the vast majority of homeowners have more than 20% equity in their home from day one, whether that's for parents or whether that's because they were flipping homes to get into that position. This speaks highly to the level of, I would say, stability in terms of um, in terms of the housing marketplace under current ownership why we continue to see incredibly low arrears rates and a minuscule number of foreclosures is because of that amount of down remember too 50% of homeowners are actually mortgage free in this country and 75% of the balance has over 20% in equity that means they have money they can draw on if they so choose. It's the last thing they'd like to do, but it does give them an option. And that creates an overall robust housing market, generally speaking. With that being said, over the last little while, we have seen an increase in mortgage fraud as well. Canada's government has ultimately, for the first time, acknowledged that there is significant mortgage fraud in this country. Part of the solution is this direct income verification from CRA. It's incredible when you actually think that this wasn't part of the process, uh, but it's an, a, a fantastic idea, one that should have been implemented a long time ago. And this solution was lobbied before the budget was actually passed by the mortgage industry. So it's actually great to finally see that the government is waking up to the industry players and taking some advice for once. So on these higher mortgage payment renewals is the hopes, of course, of cuts. And cuts have been all the rage of all the talk of most of 2024 so far this year. But something else has had a different idea here, and that's, well, the bond yield. Because bond yields are like continuously here getting pulled higher and higher based on the, or largely on the back of strong economic data from the US of A. We started this year with the five-year Canadian bond at around 3.2%. And just as of yesterday and earlier today, it crossed 3.9%, which also happens to be a five-month high. Fixed rate mortgages, well, they're going to be grinding higher should this uh, five-year bond yield stay here or even potentially increase further. Bond yields have ultimately shifted the market rate cut expectations once again. As of this week, the markets are now only pricing in a total of two cuts for the rest of 2024. Keep in mind, just three weeks ago, uh, sorry, just a couple weeks ago, that was three. And at the beginning of this year, markets were expecting five or six cuts. So that has been completely squashed. As the U.S. remains resilient in its economy and maintaining reasonable debt levels compared to at least uh, here in Canada, they will continue to keep their interest rates essentially as they are. They don't have the same pressures that we do in Canada to cut. In the States, the estimate of their first cut is now pushed all the way out to December. And again, we'll see where that is next week. It could now all of a sudden be all sorts of talks of no cuts till 2025. We're on the precipice of that already based on the information we have today. And of course, here north of the border, we're seeing consumer spending dropping dramatically, job losses increasing, and debt levels surging. So how long until the Bank of Canada detaches from the U.S. bank, central bank, and cuts our rates? Defend the currency or protect the consumer? That's essentially the question in front of the BOC right now, and a very challenging one at that. Ultimately, 
I think they're going to cut to protect the consumer based on, of course, what they've always done in the past, which is just that. So we can expect the Canadian dollar to weaken as the year progresses. But speaking to debt, uh, the total amount of debt on credit card loans is spiking dramatically. After hitting a six-year low back in 2021 at $75 billion, it has ballooned today to $105 billion. Up. That's, uh, sorry, the average Canadian credit card balance sits at $2,600 today, and that's up from $2,350 back in 2021. HELOC payments are way up too. Consumers without a mortgage have seen their HELOC payments jump from $600 back in 2021 to a staggering $1,200 today. Many of these are likely tapping into their home equity to stay afloat with other payments. Homeowners with a mortgage who also utilized their HELOC saw payments go from sub $380 back in 2021 to a whopping $780 today. Banks are cutting their exposure to local business loans, which dropped for the second month in a row in February, and this pushes year-over-year -year growth down to just 3.3%. This is the weakest reading back dating to 20 or sorry, 2005. You got to think, this is a direct correlation of our failing GDP or, or our dropping GDP. It is small business that helps to really drive GDP. And when you see loans and banks lessening their exposure to them, you're going to see an even, it's a forward indicator of a further weakening economy. Corporate insolvencies <laughs> continue to climb. And while new lending is plummeting and the unemployment rate is increasing, this is a scenario where typically the Bank of Canada would be aggressively cutting rates to balance the situation. But again, they can't make a significant move without destroying the dollar and importing inflation. We'll get into that more in a bit. So let's bring it back to housing for a sec here, because despite all the gray clouds circling the economy and any chances of rate cuts, Canadians are actually feeling increasingly optimistic about housing, as counterintuitive as that sounds. Perhaps 10 months of rate stability, backed by a 2024 budget chock full of housing promises, has the average Canadian thinking that housing is a safe, stable, and good investment. Because the Real Estate Outlook Index rose again last month and has seen a fairly steady increase going back to November of last year. Optimism in the marketplace is as high as summer 2023 and sitting around the second highest mark in over <laughs> a year. So who exactly are they polling for these numbers and in which city? <laughs> I mean, I'd understand if this was all done in Calgary, you know, an area that's experiencing a rapid appreciation and home prices at all time highs. But even here in Vancouver, the numbers continue to surprise. While we are miles away from any type of runaway blow off top market like 2016, 17 and 2021, sales volumes are grinding higher and prices are too. As of the middle of the day, April 26, when we're recording this one, the GVRD has seen about 2,430 sales so far in April, which means we'll pass through to the end of the month at around 2,800 units sold. That is higher than last year. Sales volumes are up about 3% from April of last year and will actually be the third highest month of sales recorded in the past two years. Price-wise, Average is basically flat. Medium is currently, median, excuse me, is off about 2%, but you will see HPI higher when the April data washes out. Though I do quickly want to emphasize that when we look at the big picture, the last two years of sales volumes are incredibly low. The last two Aprils averaged about 2,750 homes. If we go back as far as the data allows, which is 2005, we'll see that for the years, 2005, 06, 07, Sales volumes for the month of April were around 4,000. That's 45% more than the last two years. And the thing is, the population of GVRD was 600,000 less back then. Okay, so we have 28% more people in GVRD, yet home sales are down about 35%. I mean, the numbers are grim from that standpoint. I mean, sales are, are low. Those who can afford are doing it, but my goodness, it is trending down and has been low for some time. So, uh, The Canadian dollar, especially from my perspective here, could be in for a really rough ride 
if the Bank of Canada cuts interest rates sooner and deeper than the Federal Reserve down south. This is a scenario that economists suggest is becoming increasingly likely as the U.S. economy continues to outperform uh, the Canadian counterpart. Two weeks ago, remember Tiff Macklem said rate cuts in June are within the realm of possibility. But many economists are now suggesting that if that happens, it could crater the value of the loonie. Derek Holt, who's the vice president of capital markets at the Bank of Nova Scotia, said pushing out Fed rate cuts makes it more difficult for the Bank of Canada to ease without causing the Canadian dollar to crater. And if there's one thing that needs to be understood about Canada, it is very much the fact that it's fully independent of the United States, and nor is the, said, the central bank fully independent of the Fed. As a result, the gap between the two central bank policy paths is continuing to widen, sending really bearish signals for the the Financial Post has reported that while the Bank of Canada is expected to cut rates in June, potentially July, predictions for the first Fed rate cut have been pushed back to December now, some questioning whether they'll cut at all. The Bank of Canada is expected to trim somewhere between 75 and 100 basis points, uh, so we've been told, uh, off of its 5% current rate. You know, the U.S. Fed may be 25 points if at all. So if you're asking yourself, why does this matter? Well, remember how inflation has been cooling. It's the very reason we've been going through all of this commotion. A falling loony could literally change the direction of inflation. A weaker Canadian dollar raises the risk of inflation because goods that we import will become more expensive. How much do we import in a given year? Well, in 2023, this might shock you, Canada imported a massive $556 billion, over half a trillion dollars worth of goods. Our biggest in imports include cars, computing, machinery, construction equipment, and the all-important and somewhat comical oil. We actually have more of it than anyone else, yet we refine it down in the States and then we buy it back from them. For reference, 56.5% of our imports come from the U.S. And BOFA, an award-winning research company, estimates that each big drop in the Canadian dollar could add 15 basis points to our CPI. So, if the gap between the two central banks grows wide enough to push the loony down to 69 cents U.S., or about 73 cents today, 72, 73 cents today, it could hike inflation by an entire percentage point. This could put us back on the path of rates staying higher for longer to, com to combat this potential scenario. And much like Dan said earlier, are they going to defend the loony or are they going to defend the consumer? The trend, if the trend continues, sorry, you could see the cost of goods continue to rise. Inflation could reverse its course, exacerbated by higher gap capital gains taxes also, that have been outlined in our new budget. This will lower foreign investment and continue to push down our overall GDP. What does that mean? It effectively means lower living standards for Canadians because everything we need in order to have a high living of standard is going to cost a lot more. So that said, as of yesterday, one quick update and potential piece of respite that comes towards us in this is the annualized U.S. GDP output for the first quarter eased well below expectations to 1.6%. This is declining from the previous quarter of a very robust 3.4% and falling well short of the forecasted 2.5%. So going forward, there's five things that I'm paying special attention to. Number one, obviously, is the labor market. Are we employed or are we losing our jobs? And while jobs are being added, one thing that needs to be looked at is wages, at least in the U.S., are atrophying. atrophying sorry. They are lowering. So continue to watch this closely. The U.S. Fed is the second, the second entity I'm watching. The central bank is not showing any, any kind of great zeal that's going to ease. And that's becoming more and more obvious. We started the year off with the expectation, like Dan said, of five or six cuts, and now we're down to two and possibly none. 
So there are a lot of things that suggest that the economy is not really in a rebound position. Three, I'm looking at the inverted yield curve. This happens when long-term interest rates drop below short-term rates. This in turn suggests that investors expect and expect a decline in long-term interest rates, something that has reliably proven to be an indicator of a looming recession over and over and over. Last two I'm looking at, the S&P 500 stock, uh, stock market fear and greed index. There are four levels to this barometer. There's extreme fear, there's fear, there's greed, and then there's extreme greed. And it has been trending downwards into the fear level since the end of March. And lastly, we should all be paying close attention to this. This is the price of oil. If it affects, if, if oil continues to go up, it, it affects the prices of everything. And it will be a primary driver of interest rates. The World Bank just warned that if the Middle East war continues and becomes bigger, it could continue to drive the price of oil north. If it exceeds $100 a barrel, interest rate cuts won't happen. For reference, oil prices have climbed 2% in the last two days, hitting $83 a barrel. So there are many contributing factors that will influence what takes place in our housing economy. It's much more connected, and we are far more connected to our U.S. counterparts than perhaps our Canadian government would lead us to believe. So tying it all together, you could just imagine how all of these economic factors compound and essentially relate to any big developer's decision to move forward or not. And as we saw in the GTA area, currently they are not. You are not in a position to want to go out and spend $100, $200 million towards a project to build 300 units for people when the gray clouds are getting darker in essence. So what does it all mean for you? Well, every person is individual and we'd like to hear your story and how we could possibly help. So if you are thinking about buying, selling, or investing in anything within British Columbia's real estate market, we'd love to chat and see how we can help. Just book a, a meeting with us in the Calendly link below and we can chat and take it to the next steps. Thanks as always for tuning in. Have a wonderful weekend and we will see you here next week.